I'm Brian Foster, and this is the Grindhouse Institute. On each episode of this podcast, Jeremy Floyd and I program a double or triple feature movie night. Each of the movies share common themes, and we discuss them here. We're happy you could join us for today's episode we call The Road to Woodsboro. Despite its widespread popularity and appeal, Scream was not the first film to nod to the audience, give them a wink, and pay homage to the legendary slashers that preceded it. In this episode, we delve into three films, each with its own unique version of the meta twist on screen that helped to pave the way for the triumph that was Scream. After taking a break during part five, Jason is back and he's bigger, badder, and so much more meta than ever in Tom McLaughlin's Friday the 13th part six, Jason Lives from 1986. A group of teens on a seemingly harmless trip to a cabin in the woods are hunted by a hypnotic, frog-like alien creature. Only their knowledge of horror movies will save them from the evil extraterrestrial in Rolf Konevsky's There's Nothing Out There from 1991. Now that Freddy is finally dead, everyone, including the actors from the first film, can now live safe and sound collecting their royalty checks. That is, until Wes Craven starts having new nightmares that unleash Freddy on the real world to terrorize the filmmakers. This is the 1994 meta-horror film, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Thank you for listening to the Grindhouse Institute. Please enjoy. Darren, we better turn around. Why? Because I've seen enough horror movies to know any weirdo wearing a mask is never friendly. I wish I could tell you where this script was going, Heather. The fact is, I don't know. You know, I, I dream a, a scene at night, I write it down in the morning. Beyond that, uh, your guess is as good as mine where it's going. This is still a script we're talking about, right, Wes? Oh, well, this was a fun vacation, Nick. Too bad we have to go home now. Come on, you're not gonna let a little thing like that scare you, are you? You don't understand. We just went through a warning. Don't forget, I have rented out every single horror film on videotape, and what we just went through is called a warning stage. Well, here's mistake number one. All right, welcome back to the Grindhouse Institute. I'm Brian Foster, and with me as always is Jeremy Floyd. Hello, and how are you? Well, Brian, listen, I've seen enough horror movies to know that any weirdo wearing a mask is never friendly. <laughs> I don't know about you. Stop and ask this guy directions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm not asking him for any directions. <laughs> Today we're talking films that are, I guess in a way, the ones that preceded the meta storytelling that Scream kind of brought to cinema in such a masterful way. Um, today's films we're talking about are Friday the 13th, Part 6 from 1986. There's Nothing Out There from 1991. And Wes Craven's New Nightmare from 1994. And with us today to discuss this block is a very special guest. Jeremy, if you could please do the introduction. Yeah, so we've got uh, movies from the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, movies that would have a theatrical run, but most likely most people saw them on home video. And I thought, um, well, two things. One, that part is going to be relevant in a second. But then the second part is that uh, this is the person who... Uh, I end up talking about with some of these things and help me actually come up with some of the concept behind this block. Uh, so yeah, please welcome the owner of the video store, Be Kind Video in Burbank, VHS collector and uh, VHS drug dealer, Matthew Renoir. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. We've been trying to get this one going for a while. I'm glad we could finally all get into <laughs> yeah. the room, if you will. Uh, don't speak so soon. Just... Yeah, it's like, we're not open. Yeah, that's all. Don't, don't jinx it. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's been a, a fun little journey trying to, to get this one scheduled, but we're finally here. So as a person that owns a video store. And Which it... opened in 2022, by the way. We opened in November 2022, yeah. So you guys opened recently, um, yes. and so, I mean, this is obviously something, physical media is so important to the world, I would say, um, especially for the preservation of some of these old films, um, but I'd love to have s some of your opinions on, you know, what we saw today, um, and how that would kind of fit in with, you know, what looks good on the shelf, and like, would people come in and, you know, grab these kinds of movies, and, you know, what'd you think of this block uh, in general, and then we can get a little bit deeper into them. 
Yeah, um, well, let's see. Yeah, for the video store, VHS is certainly the biggest draw. And within VHS, it's horror VHS. And so, <laughs> yeah, this is a great block for me and promoting this business. So thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it's funny. There, there's, yeah, there's so many reasons to go VHS, I guess. And uh, a lot of it is the aesthetic quality, which, you know. Yeah, it's, it's been called shitty vinyl, and I think that's right. <laughs> so, um, that's a, you know, yeah, for sure. Outside of the actual material on the tapes, it's the material outside of the tapes. It's really appealing as well. Yeah. So the cases, you know, yeah. the, the slip cases, the spines, as we call them on the sides, you know, as you're putting them on your shelf, you get to see the wonderful, you know, fonts and, and artwork on the sides and um Something that we're all missing now with all these streaming services, right? That you don't get that right. whole feel the package and, and turn it over and, and take a look exactly. at the spine, like you said. Yeah, you mm-hmm. don't get that anymore. Yeah, and then even on newer releases, you know, there's like a 4K Blu-ray of Poltergeist and they got rid of the iconic poster of, you know, <laughs> of Carol Ann at the TV <laughs> and they put Craig T. Nelson's back looking up at a window that's like the <laughs> What you do with the bodies? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I really remember the big box MGM VHS at my video store as a kid and being yeah. terrified of it, but at the same time, always having to look at it, you know, it was always yeah. something that you kind of were drawn to. So, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think a lot of people's attraction to VHS horror is that sort of overcoming a fear in a way. It's really kind of interesting. Very cool. Interesting. Yeah, we've, we've got some horror, horror comedy today, so I guess, you know, some easy listening for the non-horror people. Uh, <laughs> right, but, right. you know, I mean, we, we do kind of get into horror, I guess, a little bit more with New Nightmare. Um, you know, Friday the 13th Part 6 is kind of like a mix of, of both comedy and horror. It kind of becomes a straight slasher after probably halfway through. Uh, and then there's nothing out there. Uh, it feels like a uh, kind of a send-off of slasher films and alien films, right. um, as well as totally. a, a tribute movie um, in, in its <laughs> yeah. own way especially with the girl that's just running around in her bikini the entire movie. You know, it's got one of those kinds of things. You're alive! Oh, you're quick. Nice bikini. Believe me now. So part of the reason that we're doing this block uh, was a uh, discussion I was having with Matthew and possibly the other Matt uh, that works there. Uh, and like, so in, in the store, they have a VHS player set up and a TV and everything. And they're just like running movies all day long. And, you know, it's just random stuff. And uh, Jason Six was up there, and you guys were, were laughing about how much uh, or how crazy the opening was with the uh, the, the whole James Bond uh, <laughs> or whatever. Right. Like, yeah. and, and, and how, you know, this represented kind of a sea change in the Jason uh, series. Meaning that, like, it went from really trying to, to be jump scares and, you know, gory and scary and, you know, leave the audience like terrified looking around every corner as they leave the theater to being something that's a lot more fun and just rock and roll and uh you know having fun with it and then on a separate conversation uh we were talking about the vhs tape that you had sitting behind your desk there for a while of uh there's nothing out there uh and that the uh the director of that would would come in there pretty often i guess and right it, it sort of got me thinking like uh, that some of those things were like, you know, those are sort of meta horror movies and Wes Craven's new nightmare was also a meta horror movie. And they, they all these movies kind of lead up to uh scream in some ways. And like, and then the, well, maybe we'll get to that a little later, but like they definitely influenced uh, either Kevin Williamson or Wes Craven in the mm-hmm. making of scream. These three movies. So Ral- Ralph Konofsky, uh he comes and runs videos yeah, he actually sold me a ton of horror tapes that were incredible, uh, including, yeah, there's nothing out there. Um, but, yeah, it's funny. He, he does a lot of Lifetime movies now. And, uh, yeah, he's still he's, working. He's, Lifetime yeah, horror he's still movies. working. Right. Lifetime <laughs> horror movies. That works, day. yeah. That, they pay the bills. <laughs> you know, Jason gets engaged, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, Jason befriends a dog for Christmas. The, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, we know our Lifetime movies. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, he's super, super nice guy and just, yeah, really sweet dude. So yeah, it was cool to, to have him in here. But it was funny because we sold the tape and then we were telling the guy who sold, the, who, we were telling the guy who bought the tape of There's Nothing Out There, oh yeah, Rolf comes in here sometimes and he's like, oh, I'd love him to sign it. And we're like, cool. 
maybe he'll come back. So we kept that tape in here for like, I think it was like two months, maybe more. And then, yeah, finally other Matt was like, when Rolf had come in, other Matt's like, oh, Rolf, sign this. And so it eventually got to the owner, but I love, you know, it was like, <laughs> it's it so like, Oh, idiocracy. that's right. I, I, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you come back tomorrow. I was like, yeah, yeah. baby. <laughs> no, but Mission I, accomplished. I, I kind of forgot about that. that like, yeah, like the reason we were talking about it so long was that like it was sitting there for forever, but it was like, no, no, it was sold. It's not not for sale, not for sale. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you're waiting for, for Rolf to come back. That's that's funny. A discussion about the horror films, perhaps? No, about what has the potential of becoming a horror film unless we do something about it quickly. There is something out there. Don't listen to me, though. Go right ahead. There's nothing out there. Um, but yeah, uh, so let's maybe get into to Jason Lives. Um, so this is this would be 10 years before Scream, right? Uh, 96 was yeah. Scream? Yeah. So 10 full years, and, and they're trying to do the Scream thing before Scream did it. I think this is, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, totally. Uh, it, this, like we said earlier, this movie kind of starts out. I mean, it's very much meta. You know, the uh, Horshack and um, Tommy Jarvis is that? Yeah, uh, the, yeah. They're in the car and they're they're literally talking as if you know they know that the audience is watching them and they're kind of just giving. <laughs> the, we're in a horror movie, guys. <laughs> Real quick, let, let me tell you where we're at exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, but you know, it's a it's a really good opener. It's got uh, little bits of Frankenstein in there, I'd say as well. Um, you know, yeah. resurrecting Jason. <laughs> oh, yeah, lightning. <laughs> hey, what's that for? <laughs> oh shit! Um, but I think the most important part of that intro to this movie is that this is the first time that Jason goes full Revenant. And he goes, becomes a full zombie in this one, and he is an uh-huh. unstoppable Frankenstein or zombie yeah, monster, like monster. Um, as yeah. opposed to being just something that somehow keeps someone that keeps coming back for no reason. At least this one, <laughs> they gave him a reason, you know, with the uh, the electric poles or the, right, right. the metal poles through him, <laughs> electrocute him. I thought that was pretty yeah. funny. It, it doesn't make any less sense than the other no, ones. No, <laughs> no. But at least it's written and it's clear, yeah. you know, the, yeah. he does this to do this. Um, right, right. But I, th- I thought this one was was interesting, um, you know, with the meta humor it started out, um, but then it also, you know, goes into the standard slasher. But then there's also the couple in the car with Jason, and those are clearly like some moments that you have. You've got the person that's working in the graveyard. Um, I guess he's just the caretaker there that right. literally looks at the screen yeah. and is yeah. like, yeah. Oh, some yeah. people have really weird taste in movies <laughs> <laughs> as you're watching this movie. Yeah, exactly. They have a strange idea of entertainment. Why'd I have to go and dig up Jason? Some folks have a strange idea of entertainment. <laughs> That'd have been funny to see in a theater as you were watching that movie, you know, just like, yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at you, asshole. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, it, it's also, we get like, you know, Jason, a sort of swamp thing, you know, when he's like in that in that uh, grave there, like his, his face is all, you know, covered in gunk and maggots. Great and makeup, yeah. It, it almost had a kind of, Zombie two look uh, to the makeup. Different design for for Jason in this one. You know, he kind of he's yeah. al- he always changes. You know, we we saw uh, Jason takes Manhattan, and he was completely a different looking Jason. It's almost like Freddie was the only one that stayed consistent with the makeup throughout the whole thing. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> it, it, New Nightmare for, is a little bit different. Yeah, exactly. I was about to say um, except for this one. He's a little, you know, he's but it's still it's similar. This one, I mean, Jason's face completely changes. It's like they they just like wiped out the last version of Jason in the previous movie, and let's get yeah. something new in here. Let's try something else. <laughs> but yeah, he he definitely had kind of a sludge, uh, uh, wet, wet kind of monster look about him. Yeah, right. I, I'd love to see this one as a game because um, it's are, like you, are you talking about the card game that they the camp blood <laughs> card game? <laughs> you know, the- okay, okay, I've got a great game. It's called Camp Blood. Now, the object of the game is first you take this jack of space, which is Jason, right? And then you have all these face cards which represent counselors. What you do is you shuffle Jason up in these cards here. Now, the object of the game is to find out which cabin Jason is in. Got to find out which camp Jason's in or which, yeah. Was it supposed to be like Clue? I, yeah, I was like, I want to know what made, that game is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is that something we can play after watching yeah. this? Actually, Matthew, do you sell that game over there? <laughs> I don't yet, but soon. Yeah. I mean, uh, for those uh, who haven't been to Be Kind, uh, he, he does have the VHS copies of Stab 
uh, there to buy. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, yeah, it's the, they're the cases. So <laughs> just ima- imagine what the movie's like. If yeah, the cases just are imagine. Cool. The yeah. Movies. <laughs> and you don't have a VHS player at home anyway, so that's the big deal. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we all know you're not watching them. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I, I love you know, like like you said, like there was the the groundskeeper Willie who talked right into the the, the lens uh, about the audience of this movie, mm-hmm. um, and then of course we get the couple sort of driving out in the middle of the woods there, and and it's very reminiscent of damn it janet and uh yeah, yeah. All that from rocky yeah. horror right rocky horror yeah and he's like why'd you stop the car and it's like well <laughs> because of this mass psycho over here and you know maybe there were examples before this but I, I wonder if there's an example that was this popular that sort of like broke the fourth wall without going full um you know, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Right. Repossessed you know, or any of those like super horror comedies. This was still like, in that yeah, horror. Exactly. Yeah, I know what you so mean. That, I don't you're, know. You're still supposed to be having fun with the, the slasher thrills and spills. And it's not a complete parody of the right. the, the genre. Yeah, um, it's not scary movie. Yeah. So it, it's like, it, it seems like a, a really unique blend. And it's like, maybe it's because at the time... They were just cranking out Friday the 13th like every year there for whatever, 10, 12 years. Well, they clearly lost their way, right? I mean, especially cranking them out like that. I mean, at this point in the last movie, they didn't even have Jason. It was Tommy who was Jason. And then they Uh retconned all of that in this one (laughs) to finish off the trilogy within the longer franchise. You know, it's like, just kidding. (laughs) Yeah. They kind of did what J.J. Abrams did with the the third Star Wars movie that he did. Like, it's just like, ah, the last movie didn't happen. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about any of that stuff. You listen to me. I'm sorry about what happened to you and your folks years ago, but no one in Forest Green wants to be reminded of what that maniac did here. That's why we changed the name. People want to forget this was Crystal Lake, and they don't need some kid stirring up Jason shit again. But what I guess what I meant was like that because they were cranking out so many of these things, like the things that sort of like would get in the way of the sort of quality control, the amount of like execs and producers and whatever, there's like, no, listen, just give me a, a Jason movie or whatever. You know, blood, nudity, you know, you know the deal. It's Jason. Yeah, and like the formula. Yeah. And in that sense, he was probably able to get away with some of this like balancing of, you know, horror and comedy and self-awareness that maybe some other movies. I mean, you know, did the Halloween franchise slide off this crazy? I mean, he, except for three. And it, and, it, and that's not really a slide off or anything. Yeah. I mean, that was just like its own movie. But yeah, I right. don't think it ever... It never, I mean, unless you count uh, Halloween Resurrection with uh, uh, Busta Rhymes. Busta, Busta Rhymes, Rhymes. Yeah. yeah. That one was just a joke. Yeah. But yeah, I don't. I don't think so. And I mean, I don't. I don't think even Freddy did that, unless you count like Freddy versus Jason and those other ones, or Freddy's Dead. Those well, ones that get a little bit. Well, obviously, like after Scream becomes this huge, huge thing, and it wasn't just Scream that was doing this. It was a lot of things that were sort of meta in the 90s it was definitely in the zeitgeist but um after you get to scream though it you all of a sudden you get a lot more um movies that then want to try to emulate the the meta thing or know that they can kind of balance humor and horror uh but uh it feels like this is a pretty early example with jason lives of balancing both those it has to be you in show business kid you sure know how to make an entrance you know what's funny though real quick uh so I had seen maybe some clips of this one or, or something. I, I I don't know. It I wasn't completely unfamiliar with Jason Lives, but I had never seen it all the way through. And I didn't look anything up before I started watching it. And the very end there, they had what turned out to be an Alice Cooper song. Yeah. Remove the mask or whatever or take off the mask song. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Have you ever seen the video for that? No, no, no. The guy that directed part four directed that music video. And I think they included oh, a lot of footage from this movie oh. in it. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. No idea. But yeah, that's it's one of those it was like when around that time when these movies had actual music to them, you know, like Freddie had that too, you know, now Jason's got one. There's the yeah. one from Dream Warriors uh, part 3 that was like oh. a super popular 80s uh ballad. Uh, yeah, think, yeah. Yeah. You know what's funny though, but because I, I didn't realize it was Alice Cooper at first and I was listening to it, I was like, God, is this like Weird Al? It's like, this is a really strange choice. I mean, like, I know there's a lot of things that were funny in Weird here. Weird Al but... would have been an awesome choice for that. But yeah, exactly. I mean, it was like, <laughs> no, no, just Alice Cooper. Oh, oh, oh. It was a real song. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I can't. I don't think we can go through one of these movies without talking about some of the kills in this, um, which mm-hmm. I really loved. I thought that they were fun and creative. Uh, one of them specifically was getting that girl's head smashed through the side of the uh, trailer that they were <laughs> the they RV were or whatever. The RV. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I thought that was hilarious. Um, also, the fact that you could probably make like a mold, like a Jello mold, out of what was left of her like, <laughs> imprinted face in the side. There. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, there was there were some good ones in there. But they again, they never really took themselves to a scary level. Even at the beginning, when the, with the two folks that got killed in the car, the one girl was kind of held underwater, and it's kind of scary. But then. You know, they show a close-up or an insert of her hands letting go of the cash that she tried to buy him off with. Right, right. And then also her American Express. American but, Express card, but if yeah. you look at the card, it says American Excess on the card. <laughs> it's re- little, little notes here and there and there. It's really funny. Like, good production yeah. design. Well, I, I loved, uh, or, or at least I thought was funny, the uh, the part where, like, he rips that guy's arm off. Uh, he's still with holding the machete whatever. attached yeah, to it yeah, still? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's the like, way that I'll, I'll they showed this, it. Please. It was very comically, visually funny. Because yeah. he like picks up the machete and then it like kind of pans down a little bit or tilts down <laughs> and then there's still an arm attached to it, you know. And he's like, yeah. he kind of he kind of is clownish in this in a, in a way. Uh, he's he's a ruthless killer. Don't get me wrong, but Jason is a bit um, clownish. I don't know how else to describe it. It's more like kind of like yeah. this goofy, big lumbering thing. And yeah, I mean, he's great at killing. He's like the Terminator um, at killing. But you know, still, it's like the little moments that he has. Like he keeps getting like caught in the in the act, and like people see yeah. him, and he's like he has to run after them now. You know, and, like it almost becomes a little bit hysterical. Yeah. Well, he, he doesn't like pop up out of nowhere the way that maybe Michael Myers or something does. He's in this front and center the whole time. There's like yeah. no hiding in the shadows with Jason in this one outside of that first shot we see of him that's like a silhouette with his mask off. Outside of that, he is full frame. There is no like hiding in the shadows. Yeah. He's not going to jump out at you. No, this guy's coming right at you the whole time. It's, <laughs> right. They definitely didn't give a shit about keeping him the secret in this one, you know? <laughs> They Which I not. thought was fine. You know, I mean, you're, you're on number six of a series. I mean, you might as well go for it. And I think that director, uh, McLaughlin, I thought he did a good job of, of understanding that the series up to now was like kind of drying out. And it's like, well, what are we going to do now? Like you said, the studio's like, here's right. your formula. Go make the Jason movie again. But in this one, he kind of, he did follow the formula, you know, beat by beat, but, you know, within those beats, it was just a little bit self-referential, which gave it that extra level of humor or no, totally. extra level of texture. Matthew, did you end up uh, watching this on a, a VHS that you had there? <sighs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we, we do. Do, I, do, you, do you want to take that back? We, yeah, we're well, recording well. this. <laughs> Sorry, uh, did you watch that on VHS? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I watch it every day on VHS. Um, no, I watch it on a DVD. And uh, we do get a lot of the Friday the 13th movies on VHS, but they tend to sell out super fast. Um, oh, really? So yeah. that's my excuse. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, I liked it a lot overall. And I thought actually the beginning was pretty pretty effective scary and gory gross you know and then um right yeah all the fun meta stuff of course and i like the little girl with the like no exit she's reading and stuff yeah. you know <laughs> right. Just a little, little jean paul sartre yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then yeah, kills are very creative. Doesn't he? Doesn't he like fold someone in half? Isn't that a thing in like the forest? He it's, definitely splits that girl's head all the way around. That's right. Yeah. Right. Does that. Yeah. And there is one of those in, in another movie, I think. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. It's like this poor lumbering guy just wants to fold people in half, and it's like. You know. <laughs> <laughs> just, just I mean, that's an interesting it. point, though. What's it. what's Jason's motivation outside of yeah. going after Tommy? I feel like they kind of, uh, right, right. you know, made this motivation materialize by the end. They're like, Jason, you want me? I'm I'm the one you want. It's like, oh, is that what it was the whole time? Was that yeah. the motivation? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's funny too, right? With the James Bond opening, like someone was telling me the other day, they're like, oh, it's great in the James Bond movie movies based on the books right it's great in the books that like the reason why james bond is such a like degenerate and he's always gambling and always this is because he thinks he's gonna die the next day like he never thinks he's gonna like right, survive right. he's always yeah. like i'm gonna die so it's like oh it's jason same thing like he's already, yeah. <laughs> like what else has he got to lose i might as well go for it yeah yeah <laughs> 
So that's why he's got to get more creative all the time with his kill, yeah. right? To keep, yeah. Keep yeah. It more interesting. Yeah. And why he bulks up, you know, he just needs to, you know, <laughs> like step up those numbers, I guess. Because this exactly. is when he went full bulk mode, right? Like he's he's a Hulk. So. In, at yeah. this point is this right? Kane hotter is he not yet not like, yet okay this is that's interesting that you bring that up because it Kane hotter is always associated with being Jason oh, but he totally. didn't play him until the next movies and these are oh, right. this is eight in 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 the series you know or seven and eight where he actually started playing him right but even in this one he it wasn't him you know and I, I I had no idea I thought he was he's been Jason since part two pretty much assumed that too yeah yeah, yeah. weird yeah, I guess my, my horror nerd card is being taken away from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but in, there's the garbage. Just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> American excess. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought this one was was interesting because the they took Jason and they kind of uh, kind of started him over, if you will, in the movie. Right. Um, obviously, they literally jump started him over <laughs> yeah. at the beginning. Exactly. Um, but you see that he kind of goes through different levels, like you you know would as you are like building up a character in a game. Um, right. He starts out, he doesn't have his mask on, but for some reason, Tommy brought it with him to go kill him. So, you know, he had to have that with. So that's the first thing he gets is his mask. Explosion. So all of a sudden now he's Jason and we know him. And then we brought up the, the paintballers who got their The one guy just gets completely uh, ripped apart. Um, yeah. But the one guy loses his machete, you know, the super misogynistic garbage guy that was starting <laughs> trying to chop down trees for no reason. Um, <laughs> but then he gets his machete back, right? So then all of a sudden now you've got like the full form Jason and you kind of see his progression of getting back into his own form and in his, you know, his uniform, if you will, of, of Jason, hockey mask, machete, right. iconic symbols, you know. I thought that was cool. Yeah, totally. Totally. I've got a bad feeling what might have happened to them. Well, hopefully they're fine, but... With Jason out there... Shut up. You mean the Jason of Camp Blood? Yes. No. You kids better leave. This boy is not well and I need to talk to him in private. So, wait, how did this one end? This one ended with um, him being drowned again, right? This is yeah. the this is the, the chain, chain around the neck, yeah, yeah and he gets lake. sent back, and then he, he does the eyes open at the end, right? I mean, it's like the right. you know last right. button. The thriller. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. gotta have that, yeah. Did you know, you know somebody put a statue of Jason at the bottom of a lake? You know this thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking brilliant, right? It's if so you were down great. there scuba diving, like, the first oh. time, like, just practicing. Nope, oh. nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first and last day I'd go exactly. scuba diving. <laughs> Get the bends to go straight up and yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you have decompression sickness and yep, yep. Uh, it's worth it. Jason did not get me. So mean. I can't, yeah. <laughs> that is a pretty mean move, but I think yeah. whoever did it was a bona fide genius. Yeah. <laughs> if this is as exciting as it gets, we're in big trouble, dude. Well, I guess in the, in the, the last bit of uh, Jason, though, real quick is um, so according to. The director Tom McLaughlin, McLaughlin, Sarah um, McLaughlin, Sarah McLaughlin. She did the soundtrack. Sarah, yeah. <laughs> sad dogs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> at the end of this movie, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so according to Tom, uh, you know, he was, I guess, offered one of the cracks at at uh, being able to direct Scream. Oh. And he turned it down, and uh, uh, later, you know, met with Kevin Williamson who. Williamson said that Jason Six was one of his influences on Scream. You know, sort of the the self awareness and everything of it. It had to be. You can kind of feel feel it in there, right? Like, um, I think yeah. he pulled some of those moments too. Just like the discussions and people clearly talking to the camera without talking to the camera, right? They're ca- talking to the audience yeah. but talking to each other, mm-hmm. and but they're just kind of you know exposing like we're part of a movie. These are your rules. We know where we're at. Like, why we need to be scared right now because of this reason. Because right. we're living in this real horror movie of a world, you know. And it just wasn't afraid to say that. And I think that that was cool. Yeah, exactly. And and even when they weren't being that explicit, they were also kind of like dancing around this idea of you know, like like the the couple in the RV and everything when they were <laughs> talking about like the, the rules of like uh, what to do when a Jason situation. Uh, you know, even though it, it almost makes logical sense for them to be talking about because Jason's a legendary figure in their world, but it it was like on that. That was fine also line a little like, fuzzy yeah. to me. The story. <laughs> it's like, when did this all happen? Like three years ago, and no one really knew about it. But this guy's a, like a living legend or an unliving yeah, exactly. legend. Yeah. yeah. Mickey, somebody's out there. What if it's that guy, Jason? I don't want to know.
No way. This isn't happening. You're right. It isn't. But whatever. We can we can forgive the writing of this movie. <laughs> and get yeah. too deep into that, I think. Um, but this is one that I would I would watch over and over again. I really like this one um, for being so late in a series franchise. I'm I'm, I'm all about it. I'm always particular to the first one. Uh, even though sure. rewatching the first one not too long ago on this show, I realized it is a very by the book slasher film. Like literally, right. I think it like solidified the formula over time of what the slasher looks like. Um, but this one, you know, it definitely did something new with it. It still kept that format. But, you know, bringing in that other sense of, uh, I guess, self-referential humor, things like that, that I think that that's what kind of set this one apart. And obviously it, it you know, inspired others. Uh, I mean, we can move on to one that I'm sure it helped inspire it as well. This, there's nothing out there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, and this one I think was apropos also to have uh, Matthew here because where does the movie start off? In a video store. Yes, the greatest place in the world. <laughs> Exactly. It's the smell. It's like the whole experience of being in that in, in a video store that I that I miss so much. Oh yeah, I mean I'm here every day. But um, yeah, it was, yeah. It was funny. Rolf was saying. <laughs> well, Rolf has another movie that's set entirely in a video store. Oh, um, I'm sorry, but I can't run up to you. What? It's after midnight. We're closed. What will you do if I just say, blow your fucking head off? What are you doing, man? Please put the gun down. I'm not impressed. He's seen falling down one too many times. You say no videos can leave the store after midnight? We'll watch them here. I want to watch a video. He was saying it's like a kind of kind of like a dog day afternoon thing, but in a video <laughs> store. Wow. It sounds like it sounds That's like cool. an even better movie. Um, yeah. But he was also saying because in the beginning, yeah, it's in a video store, and and there are all these shots of posters, and you can make you totally see, you know, it's like Evil Dead and like whatever Friday the Thirteenth, whatever. Yeah, Grizzly. But it's all these like super quick zooms on them or off yeah. of them, and it's funny. And he's like, he's like, yeah, you can get away with that. He's like, you know, if you just just really quickly kind of like uh, <laughs> sort of like scan over things or whatever. Um, but yeah, it was quite satisfying to see a, a video store, you know, and. It, <laughs> Captured and I'm celluloid kind of thing. It's a nice, yeah. Good, Gloria good Super Sixteen. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I I know what you mean because like yeah, some of the crash zooms on the posters and like because they were quick cuts and then they had like a sound effect or whatever. Like the the grizzly poster in particular sticks out. Yeah, in my mind. Totally. like it was like raw and it, you know it gave you this little scare and you didn't know what was chasing the person mm-hmm. in the beginning mm-hmm. there. Uh, but you know it it kind of gave you these impressions based on the horror movie posters. And then it turns out that was just a dream, right? As, as she <laughs> yeah. had yeah, fallen yeah, asleep yeah. behind the wheel. <laughs> so uh, you know, she's like, oh, no, I wrecked my dad's car. He's going to kill me. And then, like, yeah. you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, she's getting uh, chased by the green hand soccer. I love that and thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, like, breaking the window out and all these things. <laughs> yeah. And then we get the opening title theme song, which fucking rocks. Yeah, that was really great. Which had this like very hackers uh, opening with that like portal tunnel. Yeah, thing. exactly. Like a wormhole. Yeah, wormhole. Exactly. Did did we see where the creatures came from? Was it an alien thing? Was it? Wasn't meteorite? it a, a, something that came down? Yeah, meteor. Like a kind of the beginning of the blob. Yeah. Yeah. yeah some crashes. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was similar to that. Yeah. So this guy, he's twenty years old, makes this movie. Big horror buff. I was. I would assume just by the writing of this movie. And this guy must have gotten some major buzz around this because it sounded like the festivals or the people going to the festivals loved it. Um, but I don't know much of the history of the of the story, if you guys can fill in a bit. But I know, Jeremy, you've told me a, a tad bit about this, but it's an interesting story. Yeah, well, so after uh, discussing There's Nothing Out There well, with you, Matthew, I, I went, went and like, looked it up, and there is this little um, documentary... And it's like up on Vimeo or something now, um, you know, like, like 10, 12 minutes long about this movie and its influence on Scream and everything. And, you know, in that they sort of talk about some of the, the things that um, that went into to making it. And, you know, it was this very much like the maybe the production of The Evil Dead. Uh, it's, you know, just friends and, and, and family and, you know, everyone kind of like working on this thing. And, um, 
at the end of it, you know, it, he apparently screened it a couple times and it, it got some buzz, went to film festivals, got some buzz. And then, you know, supposedly he got it out there at just the exact wrong time. And like <laughs> horror was starting to crash in the early nineties. Mm. And then all of a sudden some of the offers and whatever he had were, were drying up. Uh, and he, he kept trying to like shop it around and he got it in front of someone and like, you know, had a good meeting with them and they loved it. And they were talking about, you know, wanting to do something with him. And then, uh, inevitably at the end of that meeting, the phone never rang again, never heard back from this person. And that person, uh, was supposedly Wes Craven's son. Really? (laughs) And (laughs) (laughs) yeah, yeah. So th- this is the story in this documentary that, that I'm recounting. I, I don't know the veracity of any of this stuff, but uh, it pretty wild. Interesting. Yeah. And it's pretty wild, you know, w- when you consider how much the uh, Mike character in this one <laughs> is, is like the Randy character. And, Randy, and, yeah. And, and, um, in Scream, yeah. you know, just always talking about the rules. Like, what? don't you realize that we're... We're now in this type of horror movie. It, wait, we just saw a, a big, uh, you know, ambulance over here, and we, we just passed that like it was no big deal. We, you don't realize that like we're, we're going. Is anyone this, paying this? attention? Yeah, yeah. Does anyone <laughs> know how, they, how these rules work? Also, that he's being condescending, like Randy was too. It's like you guys don't yeah. know this shit. You guys don't right. watch movies all right. the time. Exactly, yeah. and you know, I love that. All, all the, uh, the sort of jocks and cool kids and whatever are like, yeah. you know, what, what are you talking about, you nerd? And, and you know. He was the one who was kind of prepared for all the little, you know, horror movie tropes that were set out in front of them. That that beginning really felt like uh, Cabin in the Woods to me. Um, they, <laughs> yeah. they must have taken a lot from from that. I I, I would say. I mean, I, I would assume. But it's that whole beginning was there's one person in there that knows everything about the movies and <laughs> right. doesn't want anyone to make mistakes. You know, have mm-hmm. sex or go outside and say I'll be right back. All that stuff. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, but yeah, same kind of thing. Don't you yeah. see that they're skinny dipping in the pool back here? <laughs> Where do these people come from? We're in a horror movie right now. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, have you ever heard of the words foreshadowing? One word, Mike. Look, don't you know what just happened? Those kids were born to be murder victims and just paid us a visit. Don't, don't you realize the significance of that? I mean, he, M- Mike, right? That was the uh-huh. lead character. He goes ahead and says it, right? We're in a horror movie. I think he says that yeah, flat yeah. out at certain points. Well, and then even just before they, they get started on their journey down there, you know, Related back to Scream for a second as well. The, I don't know. There was something about the uh, whatever that was, like the third scene, which is you know the first scene's the dream, second scene is the woman waking up from the dream and being chased. Third scene is like these kids that are bored in high school, and then they get this like rock song uh, that lets them out of high school. Dismissed. <laughs> Out. Yeah, that's not Alice Cooper from yeah. Jason Six, but, uh, but <laughs> kind of the but, same but, thing. Kind of dazed and the, confused. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and the kids leaving montage, man, it definitely rang a little bell there with with uh, that that scene in Scream where they schools out uh, with, with the principal getting slashed. <laughs> Yeah, I thought this one uh, kind of had a hard time mixing the comedy with the horror. It was either it was trying to be way too slapsticky or it, w- it uh-huh. was trying to be horror, but it never really kind of felt a good mix. Um, and when I was watching, I'm like, oh, this, they wrote in a bunch of nudity and a bunch of uh, uh, a girl running around in her bikini the whole time because this is a trauma movie. But then I realized <laughs> trauma didn't release this until DVD in 2011. Yeah. And right. so they had nothing to do with this until then. And I was like, wow, this feels like a trauma movie. But yep. they didn't, you know, re-release before it. Trauma. Yeah, way before it was a trauma movie. Yeah, yeah, it's wild. Because it, it feels like it. Even the kind of uh, the graininess of it and then the low-budget feel of it, it definitely has that Toxic Avenger feel, uh-huh. Sergeant Kabuki <laughs> Man and all that, yeah. you know. Uh, it's got that kind of a vibe to it. And then obviously the gratuitous nudity for no, re- <laughs> no reason whatsoever. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. Which, which, on the other side of that, Friday the 13th 6, zero nudity. And That's I heard it's the true. only Friday the 13th in the series that doesn't have any nudity. Huh. Even in the sex scene, people have their clothes on. Right, right, you're yeah. right. Uh, that's right. Yeah, so pr- that's Friday weird. the 13th Part 6 really took a departure from the formula. I think that that's kind yeah. of the, the point here. Yeah. Well, and, and Friday the 13th Part 6, 
colon Jason Lives. Uh, you know, I think it's Jason Lives. <laughs> Jason <laughs> Lives. Yeah. Uh, but it's like, you know, <sighs> that one definitely was able to like sort of, uh, yeah, thread that needle a little better between the, the sort of comedy and horror. Th- yeah. This one, you're right. It was like, it was like extreme slapstick and then stuff that's like really, really gross and it just turned the corner real fast. You're like, whoa, you, you, you get a little whiplash. Yeah, but but maybe it plays different with a, with an audience in the theater type thing. I, I bet it would be really fun to see with a group. Um, but if you're looking for something where you're going to feel for any of the characters in this movie, you're you're not going to get that out of this one. You know, like I, maybe Mike. You know, you can kind of feel a little um, sensitive toward who he is and what he's trying to accomplish in this. But he's he's himself is kind of a dick, so it's kind of hard yeah. to even relate to him. Um, but yeah, you're just going to act like nothing's happened. Do you realize if an insane madman came around here hunting for flesh and nobody could help us? What about the phones? I mean, we do have phones here, remember? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Hello, help, someone, there's a killer after us. Please, come quick. Oh, two-hour drive? Yes, we'll be here. I don't know how many pieces we'll be in, but we'll we'll be here. So most of the characters in this movie um, only had a single name that I was aware of. Uh, One of them, though... Like we get her first and last name, which is uh, Sally Foster. So, how is she related to you, Brian? Um, well, <laughs> Sally Foster is my cousin. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, twice removed. Oh, okay. <laughs> no relation here. Um, but that's definitely the only thing that I could find a connection with this movie, other than the fact that Mike is a big horror nerd, and I would probably also survive if I was given that uh, situation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wouldn't leave the fucking house. I'd just lock everything down and not go anywhere. But I would make a pretty boring movie. Right. It, like, you'd be him in, the, in the, the first scene before he developed a conscience. He was like, nope, I'm staying right here in this room, boarding up the windows. <laughs> like, yeah. Until he gets all suited up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, that also reminded me of uh, the Nightmare Cinema um, first segment, the one with the aliens. Right, um, right. How the guy's all dressed up, but, you know... You, that was the cool mix up. You don't think you don't know who the killer is in that initial segment. And you find out that it's aliens that are being possessed. Remember that one? It was. Yeah. 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 yeah no, kind of did the same thing. They put on similar like, thing with a meteorite, uh, landing a bug or whatever there too. Yeah. Color out of space. Yeah. <laughs> Got the, the green eyes that were like, <laughs> yeah. Don't look in the eyes. I kind of love that. Yeah. Those seventies <laughs> death you... rays. Yeah, how would you Jeffrey. describe that alien? Like, how I was trying to There's describe a good it one. to someone today, and I was like, "It's like a, it's like a U shape, yeah. tail, <laughs> and and he's on like a Roomba. <laughs> like, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah. then he like melts someone's face off, but then yeah. he's shooting lasers out of his eyes and." They were kind yeah. of building the rules as it went along. All of a sudden, yeah. he had like some other power. All of a sudden, you know, it was not, then it could control minds too. That right? was right. It, it did because then with the like the, the, the yeah the little laser zap eyes, right? It right. Yeah. He, yeah. he entered their brain. But w- w- wasn't it? It was, it was kind of like the, a Budweiser frog with uh, yeah. you know giant teeth and then you know a long tail and. Then arms. So it's a frog. Yes. It's it an amphibian. A, like a scorpion and like a chameleon frog. Because we never see the whole thing, right? We just see some close-ups of it. I remember yeah. the tail kind see, of. See least, chunks but, of it, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll have to come up with a better description. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's one on the cover and the one on Wikipedia here, and it just looks like like a kind of a green hamburger. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it's like that funny, like it is sort of a frog, like the, yeah, like the Budweiser. Frog, definitely. I do. I mean, my favorite part of the movie. I don't want to say because I, I feel like it's such a f- fun part that I don't want to spoil it. But uh-huh. when one of the characters jumps over the alien, remember what he grabs onto? You know? Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> that that alone should make whoever's listening go watch it right now. It's yeah, that's true. Right there, fantastic. you go. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this movie is definitely not without its moments. I mean, this is definitely one to watch, especially for, I think, budding filmmakers, you know, like just get your shit totally. out there. Right. And, and totally. And, yeah. 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 And spend whatever it was, uh, 25 years trying to get it to be released on trauma DVD. And you might still be working as a director, working on Lifetime yeah, movies. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. you take that to the bank. So, yeah. I, you know, he, he, it's not a loss. You know, he's doing what he what he wanted to do. It looks like he's got a bunch of horror credits also. Can I, can oh, I totally. Yeah. There are so, two... Yeah, this and I think the other video store movie, he said Vinegar Syndrome is releasing or has released. Um, 
watched oh, cool. Blu-ray or something. So nice. Yeah, it's yeah, I I enjoyed it. I think I feel like out of the three, it was the one I really enjoyed the most. Like just because yeah, full on meta. I love Scream so much. So <laughs> yeah. seeing this, I was like, oh cool, this is Scream's dad or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't Scream just do it so well, though? Like, you know, like you watch that compared to these Absolutely. and these kind of rough drafts of what Scream did accomplish right. so masterfully. Oh, every every line in Scream is great. Like, I was <laughs> so per- it. purposeful. I swear right? to you, it really is. Yeah, every single line. Yeah. Um, and and the way it's shot too is really funny. Like, Scream has this kind of TV look to it a lot of the time. Like, it's very flat lighting most of the mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And I just, I yeah. I saw it in 96 on VHS. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I've just... The way it was meant to be seen? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Scan, um, scan VHS. But anyway, but yeah, so it's yeah, just, it's, it's funny to see, yeah, sort of the, the whatever you want to call it, the the original Scream or something. But um, yeah, it's yeah. great. Great watch, definitely. Yeah, no, it, exactly. And, and that's what's kind of fun about this, like, you know, especially... You know, because uh, Scream is so uh, well known and, you know, became so famous and everything like that, like there's obviously a sort of uh, influential antecedents. And it seems like at least these first two were a part of that. But there's also like things that like Scream got so right that, you know, built upon where, where these other ones uh, fell short. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it, it's, it's sort of that thing where it's like it, it sort of makes the difference just having a meta horror movie wouldn't be enough to sort of capture that, uh, that lightning in a bottle type thing. Do you think it's because scream could act as a standalone horror movie on its own, or it could be a standalone, I don't want to say comedy because it's not super hilarious, but it it, it is kind of like a coming of age or, you know, like a a young, young, young adult kind of, you know, dramedy in a Mm -hmm. way. Um, but I think be- because it's stood so um, strongly on itself as a horror movie first and like established that foundation, I think that's right. why it, it does it so well because the horror is genuinely scary in that movie yeah. and the, the scenes are genuinely scary and, yeah. the, and the, 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 the mystery and everything. But at the same time, you know, the things that are being said in frame are, oh, I can relate to that because I'm watching a horror or I'm a horror fa- fan or I'm even just a movie fan. I, yeah. I get this kind of stuff. And I think that that's why Scream does does it so well is because it cements itself so strongly in one genre, but it takes all those others to kind of like the the comedy and the, the meta and tries to pepper it in. And I think that that's why it just rounds it out into such a beautiful package. For sure. Yeah, it, it really is. It's like this really finely, delicately balanced thing where it's like, oh, it's this popcorn movie and you're just having fun watching these teenagers uh, and, you know, they're going to get the, the PG-13 relationship and, you know, um, the Matthew Lillard tongue and all this, like, crazy shit that's in there. <laughs> and then, you know, on top of that, they then take that and, like, no, you thought popcorn was safe? No, no, w- let me show you this opening scene here where she's making popcorn and uh, it's not <laughs> right. safe, right? Right. Oh, oh, right. oh you, you think knowing the rules is going to keep you safe? No, it won't. Watch, watch this, and like you know, so it it kind of balances all those things so well. And and you're right, like, and then on top of that, you know, so I was about to say is like you're right that that it's like it is uh, a well executed like horror movie and slasher and like jump scares and things that you didn't see coming. But then on top of that, it's also a murder mystery. It's right. It's like a exactly uh, you know totally. ten little Indians, uh, you know yeah, Agatha Christie, and then there were none. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and there were none type horror movie where you know you don't know what's going on or what's behind this and you know like is it this person is it that person is it the sheriff look at those boots is it that person i don't know yeah it's always misdirecting you yeah but which like amps up the, the the fun and sort of the audience uh participation in it they're trying to guess 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 is it this is it that wait a minute it's two of them what the fuck? yeah no one ever got the ending of that one right like no one called that like it's like oh who is it oh it's his, it's her dad oh he's 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 been missing right, right. for so long yeah. no no it's not her fucking dad right yeah yeah well it's funny too because yeah originally scream was called scary movie yeah yeah and so it's like right away you're like you want to talk meta yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, yeah. it's like you know what you're getting we all know you're gonna we're watching a scary movie yeah. so let's just go ahead and you know get that let's out there that. And right which the is you know kind of the idea behind the title of there's nothing out there which is like a line that everyone says right. in like a horror saying, movie. yeah yeah you know? absolutely mm-hmm. um 
Also loved in There's Nothing Out There how disgusting that pond is. And they're like, let's go swimming in it. Let's hang out. Let's go skinny dip. Let's keep going back into this pond. It's yeah. like, yeah. It's the I, best maybe pond that's just me. Yeah. I thought it was disgusting. It, it looked gross. Like, yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Not just you. Just, okay. Yeah. I'm like, there's broken bottles in there. There's like oh, that car. I don't know. Yeah. I think there was a sign that said, don't swim here either. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm sure. It was, sure. The, it was the pond from the raft. Was, exactly. Exactly. Raft. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's just all the runoff. Oh, man. Speaking of the raft, like, how much, like, I, I was getting like flashbacks of the raft when Tommy was, you know, in that little boat or whatever waiting for jason to come get him or whatever yeah. and he's, he's yeah, yeah, stuck yeah. out there and jason just destroyed that boat when he pops up out of nowhere man <laughs> yeah. he's always hated boats from the first yeah. movie <laughs> yeah true. exactly yeah, that's right yeah. that's right not his friends yeah. well i mean i think that you know now we should bridge the gap. We've been talking Scream a little bit, and we've been talking There's Nothing Out There and Jason Part 6, and now the bridge between all of this now, I guess, would be Wes Craven's New Nightmare, kind of leading into Wes Craven's Scream uh, part of his career here. Um, yeah. But this is before that. He's, you know, Robert Shea, who makes an appearance in this movie, wants <laughs> uh, Freddy to come back uh, from New Line, right. and, and we, we need a new Freddy, so who else to bring him back but Wes Craven? And this movie is kind of what that would be like in this meta world universe of, I guess, if Nightmare on Elm Street became a real thing in real life. And I think that this was an interesting, definitely an interesting script. I don't think the execution is so great in this movie, especially yeah, rewatching it. Um, parts, yeah. yep. However, what a great concept. What an awesome concept. It's, it's, Absolutely. It, it's Freddy wise, right? It, it's Pennywise as Freddy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Right. It's this it's this yeah, it's entity, this cosmic yeah. thing that's that no one can really understand, but just mm-hmm. enjoys being Freddy and just enjoys this maniacal creature that Wes Craven came up with in the story. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to take this as my as my final form and I'm just going to continue being him. Um, a totally. great concept. Uh, I just think that it was kind of hindered with bad CG from the time and like an overuse of it. And like there's just some things about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, same, I agree. And it was weird because I remember seeing it probably like in high school or something and, and like knowing it was such a meta movie, you know, yeah. and it was like, oh, so respect. And then I watched it again <laughs> and I was like, so much, the yeah, CGI, I'll forgive, but there were so many, I'll say, lazy, um, <laughs> technical, yeah. technical sort of, um, you know, aspects to the, to the filmmaking that I thought were kind of funny, like, like the glove that's you know being worked on on location and At the very uh, we see, opening. Uh, this is later when like the husband's out on location, like, oh, uh-huh. um, wherever. The camera dollies forward and then it dollies backwards and the glove's gone. I'm yeah, like, yeah, because someone <laughs> moved it. Um, and like, there's an earthquake like every ten minutes. Yeah, <laughs> it's like this. What you know? Yeah. And then when Wes Craven, or, you know, Wes Craven's like. See the script. It's what we're saying, and he was like pointing to a computer that has their lines, and it's like, "You guys." Come <laughs> <on."> <laughs> yeah, well, they, they go kind of full never-ending story on this. I mean, yeah, yeah I love what, yeah. What had to be scary though, as they're doing it. So all, yeah. all those things are in the script, and, and everything that you're saying is, is is there. And like, you know, part part of it is that like, Wes Craven's in the movie. You know, Heather Langenkamp is in the movie. Like the. Robert England, sort of like filmmakers yeah. behind the first Freddy, are all in this seventh one or whatever it is. And the conceit is, uh, if you can make out all of uh, Wes Craven's lines that he's kind of whispering uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to to Heather, uh, it's that like this thing sort of exists, and he he doesn't know where it comes from. It's just it's he's sort of like this um, uh, 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 conduit, conduit, for, yeah, exactly for for this you know right. greater evil or whatever. Did you know? It, it, it was a script. It was a dream. I didn't. I didn't know. You know damn well it's more than that now. And part of that conduit is that you know they step into the next room, they see the lines that they had just been saying on the couch. And what makes it even more meta is that like this movie, you know, was written in like '92 or whatever, and they filmed it in late '93 and early '94. And things they were filming early on in the schedule were like those like things in the house because there's tons of earthquakes in this movie. And like 
you know, they're shooting earthquake scenes, and and then about a week before the end of production, the Northridge earthquake. <laughs> Northridge earthquake. Yeah. Oh, what? So they brought the Northridge earthquake Thanks, into uh, into yeah. real See? life <laughs> because of this movie. Yeah. And, and then, talk and then about they meta. Incorporated it by, by like you know driving around uh, <laughs> the, the the city afterwards. Yeah, it's real footage. I Whoa. think of the the destruction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Added some know. production value yeah. there. Yeah, definitely. But but what's crazy is I mean I, you know just like in defending your life, which was 1991, and they had these references to the big one or whatever, and like yeah. you know the 8.4 earthquake. Why do you drive this? What do you know that I don't? Are floods coming? Hoover Dam broke? What's going on? Make fun, but in an 8.5 earthquake, you'll beg for a jeep. In an 8.5 earthquake, I'll beg for a coffin. But um, <laughs> the uh, you know there were tons of like movies sort of leading up to the 94 earthquake set in LA, like LA story had lots of earthquakes in it, you know, uh, defending your life. Um, the Robert Shortcuts. Altman movie shortcuts. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the big denouement in that one is an earthquake. Um, this movie, it's like there was, there's definitely a lot of wish casting for this earthquake to, to yeah. come by. And it's like, like rain, the rain and, dances. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this one did the, did the right combination of rain <laughs> dance to, to make yeah, it happen. That's interesting. <laughs> Encino Man's another one. That, oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. around this time, too, right? Oh. 90, yeah, that's 93, like 93, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because yeah. isn't that like the conceit? Like oh. it, he gets shaken loose or something? Yep. Yeah. 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 The glacier. Knocked from the... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's funny. Link and I are cruising the mountain, bro, and we figure we's a little juice. No, we sing the juice. We sing the juice. No, 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 we sing the juice. No, we sing the juice. Well, well real quick, uh, one thing I wanted to... to to rewind the tape all the way to the beginning of the this movie, uh, you know, it, it starts off. We're seeing the sort of Robo Freddy glove that they're building on set, which is kind of the beginning of part one, but with the picture in picture, you know, right, when showing right, and build right, the glove. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then we see Heather Langenkamp's uh, husband, and you know, he's going to meet his son, who I was like, man, that guy looks a lot like Gage yeah. from Pet Cemetery. <laughs> it, oh, it was Gage from yeah. Pet Cemetery. He's a horror <laughs> prince, right? He, he was, so. uh, yeah, he was kind of horror. A scream kid? A scream know. kid, yeah, there yeah, you go. How do you say that? <laughs> but um, the dad goes to, like, scare Gage with this little, like, Chinese uh, takeout box. I was like, God, that was a huge box of Chinese takeout. And then he, he pops it out, and there's this, like, very sock puppety green creature that yeah. looked exactly like there's nothing out there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that that was just Wes uh, dabbing all over Rolf Konofsky uh, <laughs> on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ooh, gotcha. Yeah, I thought that this one, like, like I was saying, like had a lot of good potential, especially bringing the real actors into and playing themselves. Uh, Robert England, I thought was great as always. He's even, he's great because he also plays like an original version of Freddy when he shows up at the talk show. Yeah, that, that right. scene was great too. Prepare you are all my children now. <laughs> he plays himself in his nice turtleneck, uh, yeah. <laughs> in his like professor yeah. outfit that yeah. he's got going on. Yeah. He, he was dressed like the guy in Prince of Darkness or whatever, the, yeah. the mustache guy. <laughs> exactly. But he also plays this new Freddy who's, I mean, completely redesigned from head to toe. He's more of a trench coat kind of Freddy, um, definitely a 90s scary kind of Freddy. Um, uh, but there's a point in the movie where we just lose Robert England. And he's, you know, all of a sudden Heather's trying to get a hold of him again. Robert, where are you? And all, he, all she gets is his voicemail. Right. But he, he gets you know, disappears from the script, from the story, all of a sudden he's gone. And I guess there was this unfilmed sequence from the original script where Robert England is killed by Freddy and we get to see that all kind of play out. Oh. And he plays that out and, and he becomes a, like a fly in a spider web, but a <laughs> giant version of it and Freddy's the spider. Oh. And so it's kind of a play on the original fly yeah. movie I would have loved to have seen that, especially with totally. all the effects that they were trying to put in this movie. I think that that's yeah. one of those scenes where you're just like, shit, can we like get this back in there somehow? Because I think <laughs> it would have yeah, you know, really. improved. Because he just kind of disappears. And I think that that's some of the things that I, I felt was lacking in the story. It's just, you know, you get these kind of little ramp ups with some of your characters, Robert England being the meta character himself. 
but you don't you don't see where he goes and it's like well he's on a journey too he was painting freddy he was having visions of freddy himself and all of a sudden he's like is he an evil more evil version of freddy or what does this one look like and he's all of a sudden everyone's got the same uh version of freddy you know in real life that they're dealing with and then all of a sudden he disappears and it was like there was a lot going on there that, that yeah. we missed with robert yes. england's character you know like <laughs> Right, right. Because I thought, because, you know, everyone was going through it. And I understand it's Heather's story. But to see what happened to Robert would have probably been, you know, very, uh, I don't know, a little bit more impactful, especially knowing where, you know, Heather had to go to try to save the rest of the the world. And then the whole shift to Nightmare on Elm Street 1 might have made a little bit more sense. It's like all of her, all of her friends are gone now that that know what's going on. But then the only one that's left now is John Saxon, who's now her dad. And he like transforms (laughs) in and now she's back in her, uh, her night nightgown, you know, from the very first film. Streak in her hair. And there was a kind of a hard, hard uh, transition there that you didn't really get like a smooth into that that ending. You're right. Like I, I thought that was really cool, uh, as a device or whatever. Oh yeah. Um, to to try and you know he's like w- w- what are you talking about uh you know because he stopped calling her heather at one point yeah and started calling her nancy and, and yeah. she's like what are you talking about and he's like who's john what are who's you what john? are you talking about yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're john saxon yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then he gets into the squad car I, 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 I like that moment in particular was great but, but you're right like it felt like they needed a step in between there to earn it better there was no whatever. bridge kind there of like yeah yeah, it just happens, which I think is yeah. fine. I mean, it kind of works for the these kind of movies, especially when they've kind of established that people can dream while they're waking, and then all of a sudden, Freddy will be, you know, in a waking dream. Um, so you, it, it, you can kind of give it a little bit of space on that just by knowing the rules of the Nightmare franchise. But yeah. again, this was trying to do something different, so it needed to... I guess play with it differently because it's not in the same nightmare world that we know. This is now right here, right now in our world. So it needs to establish some new things, um, which it, I don't think it did. It just kind of rehashed what happened in the in the Fran- film franchise, <laughs> yeah. you know? Right, right. Yeah, but with a uh, less scary looking Freddy because of his weird yeah, head kind of goofy looking, right? Yeah. I- I'm sure at the time it was a really cool design. And I mean, I think in, in still images and when they're really like lit well, I think he looks very cool. Um, but it's a little too organic for my liking. I like the real homegrown. I built this glove myself, Freddie. Um, uh-huh. This one was more like the glove was part of him. And it was like made of bone and tissue and, and the, everything was kind of attached as opposed yeah. to this being like individual pieces and his uniform. But such as design. That's how it goes. Not, it's not for everybody. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, un- unlike maybe some of Wes's other movies, um, this one worked so well, well, I guess for a couple of reasons, as, as like a, this meta concept or the, like the that this is happening in the real world. Uh, you know, even among those ideas, like part of the reason it worked so well was like that the, that the casting of Heather, you know, she had this look at this time where it's like, she still has this like baby face so it she could kind of play her her teenage self really well and it's like you know she had this like this thing where it's like you know she didn't look like a teenager and she didn't look like an adult and she just had this like this right in between look and it's like you know it's it's almost the, the Seinfeld thing where it's like depending on the lighting you know like, <laughs> she, she could look, look older or younger on the porch. yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so. yeah but yeah i i, I it's funny cuz like the um even at a script level, I feel like we, we were missing a, a piece or two. It was like, you know, we, we get this like little ending like, oh, thank God. We, we banished the evil forever. And it was like, you know, Wes signs it like, hey, thanks for, uh, for, 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 for bringing one this one time. home and playing Nancy yeah. one more time. And, and also forgot to mention that thanks for sacrificing your husband for this movie. Exactly. Yeah, Her like, husband's what? dead. His whole his whole staff is dead <laughs> that were working on the movie. They didn't show up to work. They're clearly dead. You know, like, yeah. yeah th- All thanks for sacrificing damage. your babysitter, too. Yeah. yeah. And she went out the way that uh, the girl in the first movie went out, you know, getting yeah. wrapped around the wa- around the walls and all yeah. that. Um, yeah. And, and, and then I think, you know, just aesthetically, we got into a weird place at the third act. It was like we get into the sort of legends of the hidden temple uh, when, when they go into the, the nightmare world or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like when she was doing the like breadcrumbs of sleeping pills, and they go down that bed sheet. Yeah, or whatever, I was like, oh, that was really cool. Yeah, 
And then, you know, she gets dumped into Legends and in the Temple, or, you know, I thought she was going to have to tackle the aggro crag at the end there. It was, <laughs> you know. The specifics it, of Legends of the Hidden Temple that you know is awesome. <laughs> I haven't seen that show in 20 years. <laughs> well, I mean, that was like exactly what it looked like to me. I yeah, no, like... I, I agree with those like stupid fire pots going <laughs> off. and there was, Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he goes out too, too crazy either, right? Like he just gets burned like he normally does. Like there's nothing really like they don't do much new when it comes to Freddy by the end. He's yeah, still... This isn't exactly a new nightmare, okay? Right. Nothing <laughs> very new about this nightmare. It's more about maybe a fresh dream. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Leave us alone, you son of a bitch! LA limousine, ma'am. Just wanted you to know I'm out front. Um, just because I was looking for it, um, in the scene where Wes Craven has his biggest scene or whatever, where he's talking to Heather about all the rules, um, there is this quality to Wes and his acting there where it seemed like this is a performance that David Arquette studied in playing Dewey because he was very, very similar to the future Dewey character in that, really? that movie. Like sort of his like, you know, his innocence and kind of naivete almost. Uh, and he had he had kind of like a I don't know, like a, like a similar look. He's like maybe Dewey's uncle or something. It was this very weird moment. Like if if you watch that scene again with Dewey in mind, uh, it, it might have a, a, a different resonance to is, it. Is it uh, the soft spokenness? Is that it, what... It's a little of that too. And also, yeah, his character's a little naive in that, which maybe is making me think of that too. But um, I don't know. There's, there's some other quality that, that made it feel like, you know, the... The difference between uh, fiction and reality was a little thinner than than we'd like to think. Maybe it's like that that earthquake thing. Maybe Wes Craven really was uh, bringing some of these things to life. It, it doesn't sound like he wrote himself, Wes Craven. I mean, into the film like he did show up on in the movie. Like apparently, it was more like a Lovecraft kind of thing, where this person is being tortured so much with these visions in their head. This writer, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that he, he literally had to remove his eyelids so he couldn't go to sleep. You know, like <laughs> yeah. a little different. And he's in his, you know, Beverly Hills beautiful home and or yeah, Hollywood like Hills his, home and yeah, like, yeah. It was Malibu. I think it was like they had this like, sure. Yeah. He was in the Getty Villa. It was like this giant yeah. house. Yeah, <laughs> nice like, house, Wes. <laughs> Friday the th- or <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street treated you well, man. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I really, exactly. I, I liked him quite a bit in the film, and and I was kind of struck by how like maybe it was more the character, but but he seemed, yeah, he seemed very gentle and like like you're saying, sort of that naivete or whatever that like you say Dewey has as well. But yeah, because it's just weird to think about yeah Wes's other films as well as you know whatever Scream and stuff. But yeah, to to see somebody who just seemed like a genuinely like nice. I don't know, a sweet guy. Just seemed funny. Didn't quite expect that. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, uh, I don't know what, like a year or so before he died, I, I knew him kind of briefly uh, for a while there. And oh, wow. he, he was a really, really nice guy in person. But like his personality was also not that sort of Dewey character type of thing. He, he wasn't that naive. You know, he's, he's very funny and all these other things. But like, that aspect of him is a sort of kindness of whatever definitely came through in, in his character of Wes in this movie. Totally. I feel like we lost him too soon. I feel like we could have gotten more movies out of him. Oh, yeah. Totally. Well, that was a bummer note. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 wah, wah. Can you come with me in my dreams? I think that only happens in the movies. Matthew, if you don't mind... Uh, if you could, if you could rate them one to three, one being your favorite of the of the group, how would you rate these movies? Uh, I would say, yeah, there's nothing out there I liked. I'd say the most, and then Jason Six, and then New Nightmare. Yeah, New Nightmare is definitely a distant third for me of these three. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of a tie for uh, Jason Six. And there's nothing out there for me, but I think Jason Six was a little bit more polished for my my taste. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I guess I'd do the same probably. Then it was you know, Jason Six, nothing out there, new nightmare. I mean, I I did 
like a lot more of New Nightmare than it sounds like you guys did, but um, yeah, it, it's still like it, it had its its parts where I'm like I'm trying to think like what what would I want to watch uh, again? Uh, which one of these? You know, <laughs> and that one's probably the, the lowest on the list for that. Um, but I I guess I wonder like it's like how when Spielberg was like dipping his toe into drama for the first time, he did The Color Purple, and some of the the tonal shifts in that were a little uneven. And then the next time he did it was Schindler's List, and all of a sudden he, he was able to like, obviously we, we always remember Schindler's as being as like extremely sad, and it, of course it is, but like there's also these like mo- moments of like adventure and fun and stuff in it too, which you know you, you, that's not the impression you take away from the movie, but it is in there. <laughs> uh, but like you know he he was able to weave those tonal shifts a lot better, and I feel like New Nightmare is a similar situation where it's like he uh, Wes Craven in this case was able to take bits and pieces out of his experience of new, of new nightmare and, and put it into scream. But you know, now he's got like a more polished second draft there to like, Oh, here's how we make this transition from this scary moment to this funny moment and back and, and how to like weave in the meta and still make it scary type of thing. But it probably didn't hurt that he had a killer script on that one too. That helped. <laughs> Heather. Thanks for having the guts to play Nancy one last time. At last, Freddy's back where he belongs. Regards, Wes. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm glad we could finally get this one on the books. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank would you. you mind plugging your store or whatever you'd like to plug now? This is your this is your time. Yeah. So, uh, so this is Be Kind Video. It's at three six zero one and a half Magnolia Boulevard, Burbank, across the street from Porto's Bakery. We do DVD, Blu-ray, 4K Blu-ray rentals, as well as sales, and we sell a lot of VHS tapes. Um, We do a lot of events, too, monthly comedy shows, monthly screenings, trivia nights, live figure drawings, sometimes Saturday morning cartoons, um, sometimes (laughs) birthday parties. What else have we done? Um, Just about... Quinceañeras? Have you done any of those? Doggy daycare, quinceañeras, weddings... (laughs) funerals coming soon <laughs> someone's gonna ask it's gonna happen yeah yeah um, yeah so we're just basically the, your neighborhood video store so yeah we just closed on mondays so come on down right awesome on. well uh where will people uh, follow you if uh, if they want to follow you online yeah so on instagram and uh, facebook tiktok twitter all that it's just be kind video and then our website is bekindvideo.com. perfect cool thanks guys thank you yeah, thanks for joining Totally. All right, next time we're going to be doing a third Hot Summer Noir. Hot <laughs> Summer Noir yeah. Part 3, the third installment. <laughs> Bringing back our friend Alex Vlahov, and we're going to be talking some hot, steamy noir with Split Second from 1953, The Hitchhiker from 1953, and The Paperboy from 2012. Wow, these movies landed in the same year this time. Yeah. And 2012 yeah. from 1953. Wow. <laughs> This is yeah, going to well, be interesting. We, uh, we, we've we kind of landed on a sometimes formula watching film noir with uh, Alex. We usually do kind of a two classics and a neo. And yeah. we're, we're dipping back into that hot, steamy <laughs> summer noir where the heat is the motivation for all the, uh, the mayhem. Dun, dun, dun. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Please make sure to subscribe and follow us on all the podcasts and social platforms at the Grindhouse Institute. And if you really want to give us a boost, check us out on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It helps us to get noticed. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll be back next time. Ciao. What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. So, what were you going to be when you grew up?